Even ladies and gents, my name is Simon Brown doing this evening's presentation. So this evening we're looking at, at trading for a living and I got good news and I got bad news. The good news is you can do it. The bad news is in an hour's time you're going to wish you'd never come to this presentation. That's probably how it's going to spell. The trick with trading for a living is that there are some folks out there and there are some in the, the, the audience this evening who take to it like a duck to water and jump in and it just happens and it's smooth and it's easy. And that that is entirely possible the problem with trading and in particularly if you make if it's your 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 primary or your sole source of income is that it boggles the brain it's psychology it's all of that sort of thing and i'm not delving into that this evening so what i'm doing instead of taking the duck to water route i'm taking you the long way around the journey you're welcome to try the duck to water route um, okay, for there are probably sharks in the water, uh, and, and right now they're sardines, so they've lifted the nets, so they're definitely sharks in the water. Um, so surfing tomorrow morning will be double the fun than usual. The first point is why do you want to trade for a living? And the reason is quite simple. You, want, you, you hate your current job, you hate your current life, you hate your current situation, and you think to yourself that trading will be the solution. You think if you can do this, everything will be lovely, um, and the truth of the matter is that that's not the case at all. If you've got issues, if there's things you don't like, if, if whatever, if your kids are the worst kids in the world, trading for a living is not going to make your kids angels, as one random example out there. This is not a, a, a you know, a, a, something, a, a pill that solves all the problems that exist, etc. As per normal, issues around one's life need to be sorted and trading is just something within life. But ultimately... The bigger issue is that we look at trading, and I need to click that button there. Hang on a second. I always forget to do that. It is the ultimate dream. It's, it's, it's no bosses, no stresses, no worries. We're free. We can trade from the beach. You can't trade from the beach because of screen glare. You can't see your screen. So the trading from the beach doesn't work so good. Um, point is, it's, it's, it's a job. It's for, for, for most people, and I know... I know a couple of dozen people who earn their sole or primary income from trading, and for the vast majority of them, all bar two perhaps, um, and I don't include myself in that at all, um, they, this is a job. They're, they're at their desk at, at 7.30 in the morning. They're leaving their desk at, at 6 or 7 in the evening. Um, they, they, they have rules. They have regulations. They have bosses. Now, those rules, those regulations, and those bosses are them. But if you think that trading is just a, you can go and be a, a trader and it's an absolute free for all and everything else, it doesn't work like that. Trading needs some sort of structure, whatever that structure might be. Yeah, you know, I'm a lazy trader, so I trade hourly or four hourly charts, and there's still structure around that. When I was at the airport earlier today, I had to boot up my, my, my computer and check because I was potentially going to get a signal to trade. And my provider doesn't give me a little mobile app that I can use, so I had to physically haul out the giant size laptop and make a hotspot on my phone and all of that sort of thing instead of just sitting back in the lounge and, you know, drinking free cappuccinos. So it is still a process. It's still a job. It still has hours. It still has bosses. And I'm going to come later to the point where we can whittle that down to a fair degree. But it's not that sort of perceived sort of free for all. We can, you know, do whatever we want, et cetera, et cetera. There is one key point that is critically important. And this evening I will talk about processes. And whenever you hear me speak, I'll talk about ways to do things and, and, and suggestions, recommendations, call them what you will. The point in all cases is the key beauty of the market, perhaps, is that we can make it work for us in the sense that if you're an insomniac and you want to trade between 10 o'clock at, at night and one o'clock in the morning, there is a market out there that is open and trading and you can trade that. Um, if you're the early riser and want to start trading at five o'clock in the morning, there is a market out there that can trade you for that. And I've taken it in the step further. I spent 20 odd months living up in Botus Hill, uh, day trading Aussie futures on five 15 minute charts and the like. Um, and it was frankly horrible. It was absolutely horrible. It was a job. It was 8, 10, 12 hour days. It, it, it certainly paid the bills, but there was no fun to it. And so what I did was I adapted how I trade. I said, well, I don't like this way of trading. So that was way back when I started to develop my lazy trading system, which now, what, 12 years later, I'm still trading. 
It's evolved a bit, but I'm still in that process. And it's that's that ability to adapt the market. But part of what I did way back then as well was say, so as a full-time day trader, I couldn't do very much else. And I said, well, why don't I scale back on that and make trading an income source rather than the income source? And worked around that in a sense. But it is that ability to say, well, this isn't working. How can we make the market work for what we want it to be? So I don't trade 15 minute. I haven't traded a 15 minute chart in I don't know how long. Uh, actually, a couple of years. Like I keep on getting suckered into it. And then I got to like, no, no, pull back. And I, you know, on indices, I trade an hourly chart. And on FX, I trade a four hourly chart. So I know I've got to check, you know, 8 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock. Those are my check times to see if I've got trades coming through. And if I'm in a trade, the signal, the system's in, I was short the Aussie for nine days. And for nine days, and I happened to, at that point, I had two positions were open. I was, in the, I was short the Aussie. I had a position on US dollar euro. And they're both in. They've both got stop losses in place. And I have nothing to do now. Which sounds great until you sit there with nothing to do. So it so happened I was moving last week, so actually I had a truckload to do. But, you know, you, 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 you then need to design that life and try and get to that beaches and, and, and sun cream type of scenario. And it is possible. There are people out there. There's a chap I follow on Twitter. Um, he's a German guy, but he, he, he lives in Asia. And as far as I can tell, he lives in Airbnb. So he would just go and take, you know, six-month Airbnb places um, and then put, you know, go from one country to another, etc. He trades FX. He works immensely hard, but he's having a huge amount of fun in the process. You know, he's living in different places. And he's the same sort of scenario when he's in a trade. He's got nothing to do. So when he's fully locked and loaded, he's got nothing to do. So now he's in wherever he might be, and he can go and sightsee and et cetera, et cetera. When he's not in the trade, he's sitting in front of his computer waiting for it to happen. But the key point that he says, which is why I just said a moment ago, is he's designed this sort of lifestyle that he wants. It, it's, as he says, it's difficult with his relationships because, you know, he can't make a date with his girlfriend because he's not actually quite sure what he'll be doing at seven o'clock tonight. He might be sitting in front of the screen waiting for a trade or he might be out there, you know, having been drinking from two o'clock in the afternoon. He's never quite sure which way it's going to spin. But we can adapt it and make it make it fit for us. But it does have it, it's still going to have that framework. It's still going to have that process that overlies it. That's what's critically important and we need to understand. The bigger problem is when I say design it how you want, that overwhelms us. Psychologically, our brains are so used to rule-based systems. I mean, where in our life don't we have rules? We have them everywhere. You know, work, home, on the roads, et cetera, et cetera, societal rules, legislative rules, personal rules, and so on. And when I say to you, well, hey, there's a blank canvas, go and make how you like, in one part, that seems really attractive, but it's just something that is so completely and fundamentally alien to us. So what do we typically do is we say, well, give me some rules. And then what happens? You've been given rules. What do we do? We don't like rules. So we fight back against them, and then it just gets messy. So what, what, the way the process will typically work is you will adopt somebody's rules, and then you've got to have the courage to adapt them to fit you. And I'm going to come back to that, but it's that... I'm going to use courage again. It is. It's, it's, it's that courage to say, you know what, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to take Simon Brown's rules and I'm going to throw them out the window and make them different. And my lazy system started with a guy called Daryl Guppy. He's an Aussie. He had a trading system. I started using it and I decided it was far too complicated. I think he uses nine moving averages. And it was like, yo, that's like, like way too many. I, but, but for about a year or so, I stuck with them because I didn't have the confidence to say, well, this oak who's written books and, you know, all sorts of things. He must know what he's talking about. And it took me an age to be able to throw his, well, not throw them out, but to say, I'm going to take his base, but I'm going to tweak it and I'm going to change it and I'm going to make it something that, 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 that makes sense to me, but more importantly, fits what I'm trying to achieve as that process. So a couple of don'ts, and I don't know why that is sitting in the middle of the screen. The, the, the most common thing I know is people who say, I've got two weeks leave coming up. I'm going to take leave. I'm going to go be a trader. I'm going to see how it works. And one of two things happens. Either you have the worst two weeks leave of your life, or worse, you make a large amount of money in those two weeks. You quit your job, and you never make another cent again until you're 95 years old. 
quite simply, two weeks leave of trading is not nothing to no one. Um, don't think it's a walk in the park. Don't have unrealistic expectations. Don't go to your boss tomorrow and, 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 and hand in resignation and think on Thursday, Friday, you will start being living off your trading. Expect this to be a process. Wherever you are, you are somewhere down that process. You know, you're not the complete novice, um, otherwise you wouldn't have been on, on, on a mailing list that got you the invite to get you here today. So you're somewhere down that road. Expect and understand it's going to it's going to take some more. It's not about platforms and equipments. It's not about you know the, the two platforms I use for trading. We were chatting about it beforehand. I mean I trade Aussie futures on a platform that can best be described as as I don't know. But it's it's average. It's it, there's no bells. There's no whistles. It doesn't make coffee. But you know what? It enters trades and manages stop losses, and that's all I, need, I actually needed to do. My platform I trade FX on. I, I'm doing someone a favor and testing it out. And I'm just too lazy to move the money to somewhere else. Um, it's not about the super smartest, most bestest platform in the world. It's not about the fastest computers or the fanciest cell phones. It's not about the tech. We're at that point with tech now where tech is, is irrelevant to the process. It is as it always is. It's about me, you, us, the individual. That, that's what matters more, more than anything else. Um, it's not about getting rich quick. As I always say, we get rich quick one way, we marry money, everything else takes time. This is the same. We've got to learn that skill. We've got to get it to a place. And as I set up on the top slide, this isn't a solution to problems that we have. Problems we have are problems, and we need to resolve those as we do with any other problem. But certainly, to quickly go back, to my point, the, the beauty of trading, and this is why I started trading in 1995, and I spent five years losing money. I was a pro at losing money. I was so good they gave me a t-shirt and then of course I lost the t-shirt because that was my skill set. And, and years later people have said to me, why did you persevere? Why did you take five years of getting battered and battered and losing money? And it's not like my losses were getting smaller. My worst year was 99 in terms of, of everything. It was, I, I was patently getting worse. The reason I carried on doing this was really, really quite simple. Two reasons. One, I couldn't believe I was so stupid I couldn't do this. I looked at this and I thought, this is not hard. How is it possible? And the mistake was I thought that. I thought that. I thought I, I can't be so stupid. In truth, trading is not about being stupid. Trading is about being disciplined. You don't need to be smart to be a trader. You need to be disciplined. You need to have process. That's what matters more than anything else. But the reason why I persevered, because when you're a trader, you're like the, the German chappy living in, 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 in Asia. Ultimately, it is that freedom from ties that bind. And that needs to be the attraction to it. The attraction to trading shouldn't be the, the we can make vast amount of money and have a yacht and then a movie made about us. The attraction to trading is that it lets us have a life that we want to live. In other words, if, if you happen to love your job, then you do your job because you love it and that's fine. And if you don't love your job, you phone your boss and you say, not coming today, tomorrow, meh. Looking so, so, I'll let you know. That's what we're trying to achieve. And that's what trading gives us. The tech is now there. The tech is ubiquitous. You go anywhere in the world, pretty much, you can get, you can get data access. Laptops and fancy cell phones, etc., are no longer massively expensive. They're stable, they work. The tech is now there. 20 years ago, we didn't have tech. I was still in a dial-up modem. And in those days, I was in a 9600 modem. The young kids have no idea what I'm talking about. Google it. Take it seriously. What I mean by take it seriously, and this is one of the key things that I, that I learned fairly quickly in the process, but when I was trading from home, and, and, and literally I had a bedroom and my office was right next door. In fact, I walked through my office to get from the bedroom to the lounge to the kitchen, etc., etc. But still what I did was every morning I'd wake up at whatever time it was. I'm an early riser, so it was probably half past five. And I would wake up and I would uh, bath and I would shave and I would get dressed and everything. In other words, I don't slouch out of bed two minutes before the market opens, you know, throw in a dressing gown and spend the day surrounded by empty coffee cups and, 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 and full ashtrays. We need to take it properly. We need to, you know, the, it still is ultimately going to be that job. Critically important is we need that proven edge. What I mean by a proven edge is some strategy that you are using in the market that makes you money. Now, that's beyond the remit of this evening's presentation. There's a bunch on the website. I'll show you some links for that in a moment. But we need to have proof that we can make money trading in the market. In other words, we need to have a track record. 
If you haven't got a track record, you can't do it. If this is a job, any other job in the world needs a track record. I, I saw an advert today looking for a graduate with four years experience. It's like, yo, hold on, graduate in four years do not add up, unless four years of graduating is an experience, I'm not sure. Um, you need to have some evidence behind you that you can do this. If you are a complete novice and you start trading, you are going to, you're going to bust out. It's just that simple. You need that process. You need to have gone through. You need to have had drawdowns in your, in your portfolio. You need to have traded through different markets. If you've been trading the markets for less than 10 years, you've never traded a bear market. That sort of thing. We need to have that backup. We need to be able to say, here is my trading account and proof that, yes, I make money. Now, it's different when you're trading part-time in the sense that you've got a job and trading something you do on the sides. Excuse me. Um, as opposed to when you're doing it full time. And the difference is, 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 is there's obviously more pressure on it. There's obviously more time in the, in, that you've got available for it. Um, and there's potentially more cash involved in it. A quick point if you are working and trying to trade, is be very careful. Short answer if you're trying to trade short term charts and you've got a job at the same time, both suffer. And the way you solve that is quite simple is you, you, move, you move your time frame up, move to daily charts, move to weekly charts. If you can make money in a daily or weekly chart, then you can make money. You can either trade daily or weekly charts, so at some point you can drop your time frames down. You know, if you're making money in a daily chart, in essence, you just take that and change the time frame to hourly and you'll make money. But don't try and have a full-time job and a trade hourly charts. It's not going to add up. They're both going to suffer. So again, it's adapting that process, it's making it fit, it's building that track record, proving to yourself that you're able to make money from the market and experiencing things so that you understand the fears, the greeds, the emotions and all of those sort of things that, 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 that buffer us as traders and cause us stress and, and unhappiness and all of that sort of thing. They're going to be tough periods. Tough periods when you're not making money, tough periods when, when, when you're drawing down. I've got solutions to both of those, so we'll park those there for now. <coughs> you need that experience, and you need to put in the hours. Malcolm Gladwell, in his book, Outliers, talks about the 10,000-hour rule. Now, you don't need to, the, the 10,000-hour rule has been, you know, lots of ridicule around it because the point is not that you need to have done 10,000 hours and that at 10,001 hours, you're now an expert. The point is we need the experience. When I do my psychology of trading course, I talk about unconscious competence. And the example I use is driving a car. And the first time we try and drive a car, we stall it. We almost crash it. It's terribly, it's equal parts terrifying and great fun except for the passenger, in which case it's just all parts terrifying. Fast forward to today, driving a car is just almost something. It just gets us from A to B. You know, yeah, we can go and have a midlife crisis and buy a fancy car, and that would be fun for a while. But we no longer have to think about the clutch and the accelerator and the handbrake and, and indicators and all of those sort of, it's now just second nature. And the only reason it became second nature is not because we went and did, you know, courses on how to be advanced drivers and everything, repetition. The same thing, the same way, the same time, every single time. We change gears the same way for however many years we've been driving. And then when I was in Cape Town a few weeks ago, they put me in an automatic car. First thing I do is I go through the windscreen because there's only two pedals. So of course, I think it's the, doof, that was break. And again, you only make that mistake once. Eh? Well, okay, I make that mistake every time I get an automatic car, but I only make it once, and then I manage to get my way into the city and all is good again. We've got to put those hours in. We've got to build that track record. We've got to build that, that, that we, we, you know, we talk about in, in sports people, we talk about muscle memory. Same thing, muscle memory. Yeah, just that the muscle happens to be the brain. So what do we need? We need capital. I'm going to come back to that. We need training, which is experience, which is consistency, which is a proven edge. There are ways we can expedite that process. Mark Douglas talks about it in his book, Trading in the Zone. 
where you go and you essentially what he talks about back testing. I don't back test trading systems because I, the weak point in that process is, is frankly my ability to code. Um, but I go and eyeball. So if I if I okay, so I'm now trading euro uh, a dollar trading it on four hour, I'm using my 721. So what did I do? I went back to a period of the chart about six months ago, and I start stepping it forward one bar at a time. One bar, one bar, one bar. Do I get a signal? Yes, I'm in, right, right, Excel spreadsheet. And I go through that whole process, just moving the chart to bar at a time from some random period in the past to see if this system works. Does it generate profits? At the end of a minimum of 20 trades, you can start to say, okay, the system does work. It does generate a profit. Then you paper trade it. In other words, in real time, you get a demo account and you run it. And again, you do 20 trades. And then it still made money. So this is looking good. Then you put some money in and you start small. You put $2,000 in and you trade a mini contract rather than the, than, than the full lot sizes. And again, you do 20 trades with that. And you're doing a couple of things. You're proving that the system works. Most importantly, you're proving it to you because you need confidence. How can You can't be disciplined without confidence. Discipline requires confidence. We are disciplined at driving because we know that when we put the foot in the clutch, certain things happen. And then we put the indicator on, well, if you're in Joburg, people stop and stare. But, you know, we know that what the outcome is from, 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 from those processes. And that's how we build that experience, that consistency, that trading edge. Training to me is in part sessions like this and in part books and YouTube videos, etc. But real training is the doing is the actual practical experience of doing it, of seeing what happens, of seeing reactions. And the best way we know how we will react and the like is skin in the game. So we can make that, that process significantly quicker. A moment ago, I said back there somewhere, I talked about, uh, where is it? I, you know, up to th three years experience. We can shorten that period, but can we shorten it to a week? We've got to become proficient. You know, if, if you've got a job right now and you're in a certain position in a job and you quit your job tomorrow, there's no way they're going to take some 19-year-old you know, person, second year varsity, and stick them into the job. They're going to say to the person, where's your experience? Where's your uh, proof of proficiency, et cetera, et cetera. We need that proficiency. We need to make sure that we know what we're doing. We need to have proof to us as well as to anyone else, as, uh, particularly if you've got a partner, you're not going to try and explain to your partner why you're quitting your job. Patience. Patience because trading is about patience because that's discipline. Patience because it's a process, not an event. When I was putting this presentation together, someone was saying to me, yo, but hang on, you're telling people this isn't going to happen overnight. And I'm like, yeah, but it's not going to happen overnight. The point is, and I've said it already, is that if we do this and we do it properly and we get to the end of the road, we have something which is amazing. We have an ability to earn an income from any connected device in the world, from anywhere in the world. That's huge. And we may elect to still be in, in Durban. Uh, my city of choice would be Durban. But if it wasn't Durban, I could be wherever. And in between, I can go and live in Airbnbs and do whatever, etc. But like any other skill, we need to learn the skill. We need to become proficient. And unfortunately, that means some knocks along the way. Lots of them, they're probably going to hurt. They hurt more because there's, when you get knocked in trading, it's not just that you get battered, it's that your wallet gets smaller. That tends to focus the mind. And then discipline. I'm coming back to discipline. But discipline and lifestyle as well as in trading. But I'm going to park it there for now, so I'll come back to it in a moment. The question is what to trade. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this because for some reason it wants to change slides. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because at the end of the day, it's going to be a personal preference. I mean, you know, to my mind, it is no doubt. I trade indices and FX. At the moment, I trade Aussie and Euro dollar. Um, I want to expand that to trade DAX. I don't like S&P because of the time zone. You know, I, I don't want to be sitting in front of a computer at 10 o'clock at night trading. At 10 o'clock at night, there is wine out there. And if it hasn't got my name on it, then it should have my name on it. Personal preference. Maybe you want to be trading at 10 o'clock at night. Maybe you think wine is for Simon and not for you. Brilliant. I like that too. 
I like indices. I like FX. There's a quick reason why, and it's largely because they're less volatile. I'll touch on equities in a moment. Um, but it comes back to, and I, I've done a, a podcast which will come out tomorrow morning. I recorded it yesterday, which is what do you trade and why do you trade it? In other words, what's your underlying and what's your derivative of choice? And the trick is, is that far too often we just sort of fall into it. You know, we open an account or our buddy went to a presentation or something, you saw an advert, so there's your broker, there's your product, et cetera. We, we need to say, well, hang on, what, you know, so I don't trade S&P because of time zone. I trade Aussie by default because I'm South African and that in itself is lazy. But I've, I've traded and I've looked at and you know, I have traded at times and I have keep on going back to the E-minis and the S&P. It's a great product to trade, but I don't like the hours. So I've scratched it off my list. I'm adapting the trading to suit my lifestyle. I trade currencies, but I only look at majors. And in my case, as I said, it's, it's USD, Euro. Ultimately, what I want to do is probably have three indices, a couple of currency pairs, and trade those. At the moment, I get locked into, you know, I'm in two trades, and that's it. I've only got, and why DAX, not FTSE? No good reason. They're both broadly in the same time zone. What I do do is I trade with multiple strategies. And what that, so I've got a primary strategy, which is my 721, which I trade. And that's the same on FX and on, on indices. And I trade the primary strategy. When the primary strategy is in play and I'm in a trade, nothing else matters. But if I'm not in a primary trade, and I, so right now I have no open positions on the Aussie. I'm probably one candle away from going long, but I have no open positions. So if I see my two secondary systems, which is gap closes and uh, engulfing candles, if one of those triggers, I will trade that to give me, in a sense, extra, extra earning ability in the trading space. Now, my primary strategy is probably in the market about 60% of the time. But it leaves a fair whack of other time for trading. Now, gaps and engulfing candles, I don't trade on the FX space. I'm just trading them there. But it's not about necessarily having just one strategy. What's key there as well is my primary strategy, 721, is a very much a trend-based system. I'm looking for trends. Now, if I was doing that on a daily chart on the, on the Aussie and South Africa, I would have been killed for the last three years because our trend has been sideways. But within an hourly chart, there's great movements. We had 11 down days in a row just the other day. I think it ended Monday or sometime. So within the hourly, you're getting those trends. So there I'm trading trends. The gap closes and the engulfing candles is much more, in a sense, either a reversal, which is the engulfing candles, and gaps really are just random price movements that tend to make money more often than not. So it's not a, when I used to back in 05 or 06 or 04 or 05 when I was trading uh, all these, I had one primary system, but I traded it across different time frames. That was nice, but there were problems because sometimes I traded, so I would trade uh, 15, 30, and 60 minute charts. The problem is sometimes I'm full long in all three positions, and then I get kicked out of all three, and suddenly I'm throwing you know, 45 contracts at the market. And then I'm, a, I'm now moving the market, and I don't want to be a market mover. That is not my plan in this place at all. So, and, and then even worse was sometimes your 60-minute chart has got you long, and your 15-minute chart has got you short. So you've got all this effort, and you're not making or losing money. You may as well just be out of the market. So I've solved that by saying there's different ways I trade. We could also trade different products and different methodologies. Certainly, if you start trading shares, shares are looking, you know, all of my systems there, engulfing candles, gap closes, and 721 do not work on equity because of the increased volatility in the equity space. I haven't traded a share in, in, in over 10 years. And that's not completely true. I do trade shares, but I trade them differently to what people would think trading means. I currently have, as far as I'm concerned, I have four trading positions in, 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 in the share space. I call it my second tier portfolio. But one of those positions I've held for eight years. They're ungeared. It's Colgrey M3. I bought it at about 70 cents a share. I don't even know what it is anymore. And I, I sold a bunch of them be beginning of last year. But that's a different thinking process. 
My problem with shares is volatility and single risk event. A set of numbers come out, something happens on the other side of the world to an industry or a company that you're in, and suddenly we see giant size moves. Anglo cancelled their dividend in 2008, stock lost 16%, in, not even in minutes, in seconds. If you're in that trade and you're geared, you've just lost your portfolio. Edgon got, Ed, well, I mean, uh, Steinhoff wants to take over ShopRite. Steinhoff and ShopRite both drop 7%. In seconds, if you're in either of those positions and you're long, you've just wiped out half of your portfolio. I just don't like that risk. You know, there is absolutely a risk that I'm in a position on the Aussie and it loses 22% overnight as it did in 1987. But that's a fairly infrequent, considering it happened 30 years ago and that's it. And the risk in my portfolio says I can absorb a 22% overnight loss. The biggest daily move in the euro dollar, in the history of the euro dollar, is less than 2%. Now, that currency only came into impact on 1 Jan 1999, but it's never moved more than 2%, and it runs 24-7, and you put a stop loss in, and everything is fine. Quickly, I want to touch on that. My trading style is always that I will, as a, not as a rule, I exit on stop loss. I do not exit on targets. I don't exit on targets because we lack ambition. No disrespect, but, you know, so I just, I went short of, I, I got a short signal on, on the Aussie late May, I think 29th or 30th of May, I forget the exact date. Um, and I then remained short for nine days. And in fact, the market went down for 11 days in a row. But I was short for nine of those 11 days. When I took that, and it ended up, I think I made 2,400 or 2,200 points of contract. When I entered that trade, if I'm taking profit at targets, I would have, I would have bailed at 1,000 points, maybe 1,500, taken my money and run, maybe 800. I let it go, which means that the market falls, and then it runs up, and then I get stopped. So I give away some of the money. My target for a move, if there's a move from A to B, I'm trying to get 70% of that move. If I can get 70% of that move, I consider my trading to be top-notch. When we're starting, we're probably going to catch 20 or 30%. But if the market were to go down 1,000 points, I want to get 700 of them. That's, my, that's, what, that's what I'm trying to do. Get 70% of that move. If I'm doing that, I'm making the money. And then you just let it run because that occasional biggie, this plus 2,000 point trade I've done, man, that makes up, that will take up my, if my next 10 trades are losers, now I'm flat. Importantly, my next 10 trades might be losers. And that boggles the brain. That hurts. There is no upside to a string of losing trades, except guaranteed it's going to happen to you. I'm also a very, I am a 100% systems-based trader. In other words, I have rules and I follow the rules. There is no opinion. There is no thought. There is no sentiment. I am 100% based trading on rules. Why? Because it removes me from the process. I'm the biggest risk to my trading. So I'm rules-based. By being rules-based, it also means I'm, I'm able to replicate what I'm doing. If I'm trading on gut feeling or on sentiment or something, am I truly able to replicate that? Nah. You know, frankly, it depends how much wine I drank last night. And in my case, that's never a good indication. Because if there's wine, I was drinking it. And I am not fussy, as long as it's red. So it might have been cheap wine, and then it makes the hangover infinitely worse. So I'm completely rules-based makes my life a heck lot easier. It means I can glance at a chart and, in, in, and literally in a second tell if I need to actually spend time to see if my signal's there. And when I say spend time, you know, when I find up my computer at the airport, the process takes time. But once I got the chart there, I look literally two seconds, nope, not there, shut the computer down. Carry on my way. Last point is when I get, when I, every trade's obviously got a stop loss in, my stop loss I put into the system. So for those nine days that I was short, I didn't have to do anything. My stop loss is in the system. As long as my broker is reliable and executes, and they are, and they do. Stop loss is in the system. For nine days, I don't have to look at a chart. I mean, I do. 
Uh, every morning at open, I want to know what's happening. I, you know, it's my job to write about markets and to comment about markets and the like. So obviously, I'm keeping wind of it. But I don't need to be at that coal face watching it every second. There are folks who make money trading equities. Um, there are trading rooms of people who trade equities and they make money. I, I mean, I've made money on equities, but you know, the, 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 to my mind, so, so certainly in my experience, without any shadow of a doubt, the money I've made on equity trading has been minuscule compared to index and, and FX. And maybe that's because I stopped trading equity 10 years ago. Um, and, and you know, as a trader, you get better every day. And maybe if I'd continued. And I stopped trading equity for two reasons 10 years ago. One, I didn't like them. Uh, and two, I joined online share trading and there were compliance issues and all of that sort of issue uh, and media. And it just became, it was just easier to say, I don't trade equity anymore. It just made the whole process simpler. And then I saw, when I was working there, I saw the EdCon takeover, delisting, 40% move in seconds. I know someone who was short EdCon at that point. He lost 300%. So he lost his portfolio, plus two more of them he had to pay in. I saw clients when I was at online share trading who were long Anglo when they canceled the dividend and it fell 16% in a moment. And I don't know. I can't. There is no. And it's not like your stop, your stop loss will trigger and you'll get it to market in, in, in under a second. Problem is that that less than a second, that stock has fallen way more than your, your stop loss is sitting. Stock was here, stop loss there. And market is now here. And you got to get out. And you and I don't I, I just can't see any way to manage the risk, so I walk away from it. The folks I know who who trade um, equities and make money broadly do it one of two ways. Either they're sitting there on a tick chart, or they don't even have a chart, they're just watching bids and offers, and an average trade duration for them is measured in minutes, like two or three, maybe a long term trade, 15 minutes. And then the other folks who are doing geared, but low geared, two times gearing, maybe two and a half times gearing, and will run trades that will run for weeks, months, or, or maybe even a year. That in-between sort of space where you're trying to run a trade for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, to my mind, is, is really, really hard. I mean, discipline is what makes us a trader. Um, without a shadow of a doubt, but risk management is what fits into it. And I'm not delving into it this evening, but that is stop losses. That is 2% rules, 6% rules. It's overall portfolio uh, risk that you're running. Um, it's the gearing of your portfolio. If, if you've got, you know, 100,000 Rand, you can turn that into a million bucks overnight. That's not a good idea. You know, if you look at folks like Goth McKenzie, like Warren Peacock and the like, folks who are trading for a living, they're gearing their portfolio maybe three or four times. In other words, if they've got 100,000, they've got total exposure into that market of maybe three or 400,000. Now, when you move into the index and the FX space, those numbers change wildly, but that's because of lower volatility. And I know we, we think that volatility is good because we think if we're on the right side of it, we'll make a fortune. Yes, but you won't always be on the right side of it. And those, those volatility spikes, the EdCon, the, the, the Anglo, and I appreciate that there, there's, there are a few examples, but those examples are out there. And each of those examples resulted in your portfolio being decimated. Instead of folks, stress test your, your trading portfolio. Take every position that you currently have and move the underlying price 20% against you. So if you're long something, make that price down 20%. If you're short, make it up 20%. Do that to your entire trading portfolio right now and see what happens to it. Does it survive? The answer is no. And maybe it does, but almost certainly the answer is no. In which case, you're one black swan event from going bust. And black swan events are, 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 are Anglo canceling dividends, Edcon being taken over, you know, Steinhoff wanted to buy a shop right, and, and so the list goes on and on and on. There's a series on the website, the link is there, just onelap.com slash bootcamp, 12 videos, 12 hours, 
around managing risk, around different processes, around stock losses, around portfolio risk, around news events, risk and that sort of thing. I care nothing for news. I'm not. A, I'm, I'm a mechanical trader. I mean, I'm obviously watching the news. I have Twitter. I, I you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a news junkie. But I don't trade on the news. I leave that alone. News drives the price. I care about the price. I don't know what if, I mean, so, so, in, so, so typically when a company announces a takeover of another company, one goes up, one goes down. Usually the one being bought goes up and the one buying goes down because you assume that the buyer is overpaying and that this, you know. Steinhoff announces they're going to take over ShopRite, which ultimately didn't happen. Good thing. But nonetheless, both went down. It's like, whoa, what happened there? It's called a market. It does crazy stuff. There's, the, markets are not, the markets are not if this, then that, which is very much what life is. You know, life is if this, then that. We do something, we expect something to happen, and usually it does. In the case of the market, that is not so. There's just too much stuff out there. We're never quite sure how it will respond how long that response will follow through. And then trading systems. And again, beyond the remit of this evening's presentation, but obviously you need some methodology for trading. My 721 is not there. If you want to drop me an email, I will send you a link to a video for that. But there's a bunch of different trading systems there. CFD, index, FX, equity, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the point is you need a start point. As I said to you earlier, use that as your starting point, and then you expand from there. Make it your own. Make it fit with your own methodologies. But it's a place to start to give you a, a well, here's day one. Now we can take it from there in a sense. <sighs> Discipline. And I come back to it because this was trading about. Trader's Journal. So when I was day trading, the hardest part for me was the Trader's Journal at the end of the day where you are mentally exhausted. Physically, you haven't done more than click your mouse a hundred times and maybe tap your foot. But a trading journal. I still do now, but now I do less trades. Back in the day then, I would sometimes do 40 trades in a day. Particularly when, I, for a while, I was in a five-minute chart, which was a terrible idea. Stay away from the five-minute charts. Oh. Um, even if you're ADHD, five-minute charts are bad. The, 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 the trader's journal. So I, every time I finish a trade, I mark it out a seven. Many of you have heard about my perfect trade. I do a, a score in my trade. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping a log of what's happening because it instills discipline in me. It gives me space when things go wrong. I can go back and check. I can see if I'm making errors or something like that. This is what I say. In part, trading is a job. In journals, that paperwork we all hate. The problem is the only person making you do it is you, which is why I say you have a boss. The trick is you're the boss. And that requires discipline. Because, man, you can lie to yourself. Certainly, I can lie to myself a hundred different ways before I finish my first coffee in the morning. Process. And, and it, it, if it comes back to unconsciously competent, such as driving a car, works because of process, because of repetition, because of muscle memory, that muscle being the brain. Because we do the same thing, because we flow the same way, because we've got the same process that follows. If you, if, if you say this works and I want to replicate it going forward, it only works if there's process. If the process was, well, I would log on in the morning and randomly do something, there's no process. It's not replicable. You can't say I can do this and it will succeed. You need to have that process. And I'm very rigid with it. I do the whole. So, so my point is quite simple. I need to be able to explain my trading system in under a minute to keep it simple. And I also have flowcharts. There's a website called bubble.us. And you make these big bubble charts. Basically, they're the flow charts. And my whole trading systems are in these flow charts. If this, then that. And it's an amazingly useful experience. Not because in any way, it just, it just solidifies all the what ifs. You know, and even now, I mean, I've been, you know, I, I, I did it. I did it about a year and a half ago for my lazy system. My, my very lazy, which, which is the, I trade the sub in, sub-indices on weekly charts on ETFs, and I did that whole process, and it just made the whole, now when I update my charts on a Sunday and send out the emails and the like, it's infinitely easier, 
because I've so clearly clarified every possibility in my mind. Now, small things. I enter on Monday. So you've got to have an asterisk that says, well, unless the market's open, in which case the next day it's open. It's a small thing, but it's part of that process. And you've got to have strategies for when things go poorly. I call it tilt, which is a poker analogy. It, it's going to happen. I mean, it hasn't happened to me for a number of years, which to my mind then simply means that it's just around the corner. The fact that it hasn't happened for a number of years, I am not so naive as to think it will not happen again. Every day I wake up and I think, well, today be the day I go and tilt. Not quite, but you get the sense. That, so, so the going on tilt is typically what typically happens is you, 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 you follow the rules, you lose money, you get angry, you revenge trade, you lose more money, you get angry, you more, uh, boom, boom, boom. And, and you, I mean, I have destroyed entire portfolios in an afternoon. Now, I, I carefully, in 1999, which was my worst trading year, I'm carefully, carefully, I'm making money, I'm making a couple bit here and a bit there and a bit there. And come June, I'm ahead for the year, the first time I've ever got to June and had a profit for the year. Everything's lovely. And then a company called MoldMed comes out with a sense announcement, or I don't even think there was sense back then, comes out with an announcement. And everyone had been hopping on the forums. And I was being disciplined. I don't buy this. I've got process. And then the announcement comes and I abandon the discipline. I buy the stock and I traded it at the highest price that stock ever traded in the history of MoldMed. And then it fell, so I bought more and then it fell more and I bought more. And it, eventually I had so many shares, I almost had a seat in the board. Unfortunately, the stock was at one, percent, one cent and I couldn't sell it. I destroyed a portfolio in an afternoon. So now I have process for when I'm going on tilt. And the first, and you know when it's happening, but the first point is being self-aware so that you feel it, so that you sense it. And my process is really, really simple. Shut everything down. Everything. Twitters, trading platforms, just, just shut everything down and walk away. And I take it a step further. So what I've got, I, 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 I don't play computer games with one exception being civilization which I've been playing since 88 was the first time it came out. Was it maybe 92? I've been playing it for two and a half decades. So my reward for tilt is when I go and tilt and I shut down the reward is I can go and play civilization and I'll play an entire campaign and I play in the large map. So it's about 14 hours of gameplay. And I love it. I absolutely love it. It's the most fun I can have. Well, not true. There's wine and there's surfing. And, but it's a huge, you know, it's definitely a top three thing to do in my life. But there's not often I can give myself 14 hours. That's my reward. I go and tilt. If I follow the process, which is shut down, get out, close all trades. Any open trades get closed, shut down, and I can now reboot my computer and I can play Civilization. We're now in Civilization 6. It's great fun. I play as a prince. I usually whip everyone. The key point is recognizing it. And I, so for me, everyone's got to tell when they go on, on tilt. My tell, my eye twitches. As soon as I feel that eye twitching, shut down. Things are going to go pear-shaped here. Get the heck out of dodge. Have yourself a reward process. And then I play through. I play a full 14 hours. I, I mean, I made break for naps. Um, but I don't trade again until I'm finished civilization. Sometimes it's 10 or 14 hours for a complete playthrough. Then I can start again. Because tilt's going to happen. Some politician somewhere is going to do something that's going to cost you money. I can promise you that. Why? Because they're politicians and it's what they do best. So here's the big question is how much money do you need to start trading for a living? And this is quite frankly, how long is a piece of string? There are a hundred different answers to it. Here's my answer. And I went and did a Google over the weekend to look for other answers. And pretty much I probably found a hundred other answers out there. Mine is exceedingly conservative. So I don't want any of you Oaks going bust and coming back next time we're in Durban with, with friends and pointy sticks and stuff like that. My view is you need two or three times your annual living expenses in order to do it. And here's why. The, the, the last thing you want is to be needing to make this month's, to make next month's living expenses this month. In other words, let's say you need 40 grand a month to live. 
and it's June, and you need to make that 40 grand by the end of June, otherwise you don't live in July. That is not fun. You are trading under pressure. You are going to have months that are flat. You're gonna, if, if you're averaging 40 grand of profit a month, that means some months you're making 80, some months you're making 40, some months you're making zero, some months you're losing 50. You're averaging 40. So what I always do, I say, you know what, get one year's living expenses in the bank. That takes all that pressure off you. Now you've got 12 months to make a year's living. That doesn't sound hard. The hard part is getting the full year's living expenses. I get that. I'll touch on that in a second. But just by, if, if you've got, so let's say you need 40 grand a month. Let's call it half a million. It's a nice round number. You've got half a million rand and you say, well, cool. If I can double my money every year, I can live. Yes, but you're putting pressure on yourself. Those bad months are going to really, really hurt. Or worse, the months when just the market isn't playing game. You know, I had a really good April. I'm having a really good uh, June, but May was I think I made, I, 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 I made a case of wine in May. I, I'm not a wine snob, hey? so when I say a case of wine, like 500 bucks. But that's no stress because you've got the money, you're living off it. So I say always take your first year, stick it there. And then the question is, what is the return that you're doing? If you can double your money in a year, then you need two times annual expenses. If you're doing 50%, then you need three times annual expenses. Frankly, I think if you can do 50% a year, that's a good number. The top traders I, I know out there are doing, are doing magnitudes of that, but it's going to take you time. There. There, 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 there's a chap. I mean, on a good day, he'll make 200,000 rand. I don't know what his living expenses, but he ain't spending 200 grand in a day. And here's your top tip. Hey? When you make good, big money, do not go and buy a supercar. Because every single trader I know who's bought a supercar has crashed it. Now, you know why? Because you're in your Ferrari or your Lamborghini, and one day you think, I'm going to put my foot flat in the accelerator. And you know what you are not? You are not Sebastian Vettel. When that car goes from zero to 60 in half a second, you're going to crash it. There's a chap, there's a, <laughs> it's an Austin, I shouldn't laugh, but one of the security states in, up in Joburg, this guy buys a Ferrari, he drives it home, he's done about 14 Ks on the clock. He gets into the estate and he's showing off and he puts his foot flat and he just goes, zhoof, lands in the swimming pool. The car hasn't yet done 25 kilometers and it's written off. You know why? Because he didn't know what would happen when he put his foot flat, because you have no idea what a supercar does until you put your foot flat. Best advice, don't buy one. So there's a, a, there's a trading, a, a prop desk I know, and all the kids come through, and they make a fortune of money, and they all go and buy a fancy Lamborghini, Ferrari. None of those cars last more than a week, not one. And then a week later, they're back with a much more, still fancy car, but much less super. <laughs> <coughs> so the trick here, <clears throat> this is a exceedingly <clears throat> lower risk way of doing it. This means you've got a year to make next year's money. It means your pressure's not on until August or September or October. And I know what you're thinking, man, if you had three times an annual salary right now, you wouldn't be here. You'd be out in the streets of Durban living at large. Fair comment. A couple of points. And I'm here, I, I moved it to the million. It gets big quick. I mean, a million rand, you can easily gear to 50 million. Whether you want to is another game in its entirety. But that 50 to 100%, as soon as you start clocking that sort of number, and it's entirely possible, but there's almost like a tipping point. And I stress here, this is less shares, this is more indices, in fact, this is, and, and currencies. There's a tipping point where, where, where you're struggling and struggling, and you're doing 50 a year, and that's nice, that's 4% a month, that's lucky, you're making the money, everything's good, and then it just tips, and then you go from 50% a year, and suddenly you're clocking you know, you're clocking 100, 150, 200 or something. This will ramp fairly quickly. The other trick is that at a certain point, portfolios just get too big to manage. You know, I trade Aussie futures. I, I won't trade more than 12 contracts at a time. To me, more than 12, it's just, I'm starting, you know, if I'm exiting over a quiet lunch on a day before a public holiday, I'm moving the market. No, I don't want to be that oak. You know, I, I once threw 36 contracts at the market, and it was messy. 
It was horribly messy. I, I, I think I spiked at 120 points. And that was, I mean, I just, yeah, it was just throwing money away. It was, I played Civilization after that. That, that, that tells you all about that one there. Um, and I know what you're thinking. So, so it gets big. And I know what you're thinking. You only got 10 bucks, man. This where you're going to get. But there are processes. There are plans. Of course, you haven't got three times annual salary at this point in the process. I get that. I fully appreciate that. But maybe you don't need the 40. I mean, look at those expenses. What I mean, you know, there, there, there are many parts to the process. And it's things such as, for example, understand that when you leave your job, you still need medical aid, but it's going to cost you more because the company was paying part of it. But also, you're not driving to work anymore, so how much was that costing you? I mean, there's all of that sort of thing. And don't, don't bother getting disability insurance if you're a trader because, man, they don't understand that shite. Uh, that that's sort of so so rebudget it. Understand that a lot of and it's a personal process. I've just sold a giant house and last week I moved into a tiny flat. Relative, it's 85 square meters, but I went from a 385 square meter house. So for me, it's it's tiny flat. Um, it's still bigger than most places in this country, but nonetheless, um, it's lifestyle creep. You know, my wife cancelled. At Christmas, we talked about cancelling DSTV. I tried to watch rugby two Saturdays ago, and I said to my wife, Why, what's this error message? And she said, remember the conversation we had? I'm like, yeah. She said, I cancelled it. And I'm like, what do you mean? She said, Simon, it's five months, and you haven't noticed. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, okay, I'll go to the pub, watch the rugby there. Um, which at least we won. I don't mind going to the pub to watch rugby. I hate having to buy a beer and then we lose. That's really bad. But it, 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 have a look at, I mean, so you, you need 40,000, do you? Maybe you need 20. What's that process? You know, and maybe that requires some, some lifestyle cuts. Maybe your, your red wine has to go from bottle to box. Okay, that's quite rough, but, you know, apparently there's some good boxes out there. In other words, what I'm saying is don't expect it to be beaches and sun cream tomorrow. There might be some lifestyle pullbacks now. The sacrifice is well worth it. So you pull back your life. You, it's box wine. It's no DSTV. It's whatever. But roll it forward three years, four years, whatever, and then you can go and buy yourself a wine farm because that's even more silly than buying a supercar. <laughs> um, and of course, Trade your way to that capital. So you want to quit your job to be a trader. Well, you have to be a trader in order to do that. And if you are a trader, you are making money. And yes, this might take you some years to do. It took me five years. But the ultimate end game is worth every penny of it. And if that sacrifices, it's going to take a little while before I can build the capital. And I'm going to have to potentially downgrade my life. Sure and sure. Support trading rooms, uh, Trader Pier 3, actually. So if you want to be a day trader and blah, get onto Twitter, speak to Pier 3. Uh, he doesn't have a Durban office, but in fact, I think they might have a Durban office. They take people in. They take you through the process. If you're any good, they'll give you money and let you trade. If you're no good, they'll kick you out the other side. But contact Trader, trade, uh, trader Pier 3 on Twitter. Pier 3 Raiden Hayes. He writes for just one lap. Um, trading rooms. Careful of them. They're often expensive. There's often far too much t t testosterone and ego floating around there. And the problem with trading rooms is the same problem as online forums, social media, etc. Noise. In other words, you've got a position. You're short. I mean, I was short for nine days. And every day there was an oak on Twitter. He said, here's the bottom. The market's going higher. And I'm just experienced enough now to ignore him. He might be right. I don't know. I don't care. But it's hard to trade when there's people chirping in your ear, particularly if they're chirping other trades and stuff. And then you all get into a trade together as like a buddy. You break, to me, I want to trade in quiet. Maybe to drink, to watch rugby and drink beer and wine with people, but I don't want to trade with people. Leave me alone. Um, trading buddy is a brilliant idea. Someone who understands, because when you go to your partner or your friend or your ex-colleague and talk about trading, they don't understand. A trading buddy is another trader out there who, who understands the, the, the emotional impacts of trading, who understands the highs and the lows, who understands the processes. More importantly, they have total access to your account. They have your password. They have 100% access to your account. And they are obligated at least once a week to log on and make sure that all of your trades meet your rules. In other words, they keep you honest. 
And I tell you what, that works better than anything. The last thing you want is your, that phone call from your tradie buddy saying, Simon, there's a trade here I don't understand. It's embarrassing. Now you've got to lie your way out of it. And you can't, right? Because they can see the chart. They can see the trade. They know your system. Trading buddies are invaluable. It also means that if you've got an open, you know, that they can manage things if you can't. You're on an airplane. They can, that sort of thing. Finding the person is hard. But I, I mean, I, I don't have a trading buddy now, but I did in the early 2000s. And, and, and without a shadow of a doubt, without him, I wouldn't have succeeded. <sighs> Speak to your partner. Tell them what you're doing. They're going to hate it. They're going to tell you you're a fool. They write on both counts. Um, but that's fine. But this is, this is, this is not something, and yeah, maybe you don't have a partner, in which case, no problems. But if you do, this is something they need to be involved with as well. And, and don't, as someone did, tell them to go and talk to Simon. <laughs> no, so we went talking and we drank wine and got horribly drunk, and I don't know what happened. Um, but certainly, I didn't make her any more convinced that her husband should be a trader. And this is what I talk about. What it is is freedom from ties. It's less about having a job. What do we want? We don't want a job. Trading is another job. And it's what I mean by designing it around what you're trying to achieve. I call it lazy trading. It's about, if possible, multiple income streams. We live in, the, in a connected world. There are hundreds of ways where we can make small bits of money here, here, and there. Now, there's a chap here I know, my neighbor, my new neighbor in Joburg, who sells stuff on Etsy. He makes five or ten grand a month. He sells the stuff all over the world. He's never going to get rich from it. But it's, you know, that five or ten grand a month takes him a couple of hours a month, and it's just some money, and then he does something here. I'm not sure what else he does. But he's got the Etsy thing. I need to work out because he drives a massively fancy car. That Etsy did not pay for the car. And I'm a little bit nervous because, like, maybe he's a hitman or a, you know, a sex worker or, or drug dealer or something. And that could get awkward. Um, make it work for you. What we want is to wake up in the morning and look forward to our day. Trading can help that. But if trading is just another 10-hour working day, that's not the answer. Talked about that. Backup plans, there's pros and cons. To me, the backup plan is have a year's living money. If your backup plan is you say to your boss, can I take a month's leave? You almost want that free fall below your feet. Because if you've got too many parachutes in your back, then it's not real enough. That makes sense? And maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that. I and understand my commitment, so I don't have children. I, yeah, my liabilities are smaller. But I'm... I, to me, too many parachutes means we're not serious enough. And at this point, you're probably depressed. You're probably wishing you'd never heard of this presentation. You're probably wishing you'd never come here. The key point is, is, is realism is good. Most importantly, it's a journey. Start that journey. Plan the journey. The point for this evening is to help you start to make that plan. To realize that A, it's possible, and B, it's not an absolute walk in the park. That there's stuff we need to do to get there, and today was part of that journey. Because it is totally possible. I know it stacks of people who do it. I have done it. I chose not to do it full time because it was a terrible job. But I earn a significant chunk of my revenue from trading. And it's becoming more significant as I try and work less and less. Um, it, it could be the worst decision you have ever made. But it could be the best. For me, it was, for a while, it was the worst, but it's now the best decision I ever made. I, it's, this is something that we should be teaching eight-year-olds. This is true freedom from ties that bind. This, this can work. Yes, it's a journey. Yes, there's stuff we're going to have to learn. Yes, at times you're going to hate it. You're going to wish you'd never heard of me, the JSC, or anybody else. That's like any other journey. You know, the current skill you have, there were times you wish you'd never heard of that either. You hated that and parts of it. I'm going to park it there because I've hit my time. I appreciate some people need to leave. We'll let that happen. We'll shut the webcast. And if there are questions, I will take some questions. Let's take 30 seconds if folks have to leave. Uh, that's fine. I think I have run my time by three minutes. Um, ladies and gents, really appreciate it. Hope, I hope it was. The key point this evening was, as I said, a nice dose of realism and a sense that this is entirely possible. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you.